and we are live. Welcome everybody to the inaugural episode of Kvetching with Adam and Jared. Um, at least that's the tentative title for now. We are both um, just experimenting for, for one time here to see how it goes. And um, we are, I will apologize in advance that our technological skills when it comes to video in the, 20, uh, in the 2020s kind of sucks for both of us. I was a pretty good videographer back in the day, 20 years ago, but I have lost skills uh, since then. So um, this might be a bit unwieldy, but that's okay. Uh, I will introduce myself first. I am Dr. Jared Tani. I teach Jewish history at UNC Wilmington. I hold the block chair in Jewish history. And along with Adam, um, I founded the Jewish Studies Zionist Network about a year and a half ago, a year and a few months ago, which we will discuss in greater detail uh, later on. Adam? I'm uh, Adam Fuller, uh, Associate Professor of Political Science at Youngstown State University, where I also teach Jewish studies, uh, in particular Israel studies. So along with Jared, uh, I helped co-found the uh, Jewish Studies Zionist Network. Terrific. Adam, I'm just going to start, you know, is it true that earlier this week, someone uh, who I believe is a professional psychoanalyst that didn't like what you had to say, so he said, liar, liar, hair on fire? That's true. Yes. Um, I was uh, uh, consulted by a psychoanalyst, someone that teaches Jewish studies, but also is supposedly uh, by profession a psychoanalyst who, um, without uh, actually... Uh, you know, taking the time to to sit down and get to know me, you know, have me lay down on the couch and hear me tell them all about myself and my past and everything, uh, decided to uh, say to me, liar, liar, hair on fire, right? I'm a hair on fire type, he said, I guess because uh, I raised some legitimate objections to the uh, film, the Israelism film which we'll be discussing in a couple of minutes. But I, I looked the guy up afterwards, and, and to my surprise, he actually had far less hair than you did. That's true. Yeah, I mean, I'm not claiming to, you know, have a really good head of hair. I am gradually You're clinging to some scraps, uh, if you will. I'm clinging to some scraps, and I will say that if we're talking about hair catching fire, you know, I, I have enough for some kindling, you know. This guy, on the other hand... Uh, was a complete cue ball, right? Like there's he had no a serious way. beard, though. I could see that thing going he up. Did. He did. Yeah, have a very long, you know, Rip Van Winkle kind of beard. Yeah, hmm. that's true. Yeah. Well, what a world! What a country! What a field of Jewish studies! What a I profession know. of psychoanalysis! You know, I, I think know. you would have actually gotten better treatment if you were forced to see a psychiatrist in the Soviet Union who would have then sent you off to the Gulag. They wouldn't have even insulted you that way. I mean, yeah, you'd be doing 10 years of hard labor afterwards, but at least um, you wouldn't have your feelings hurt um, about what remains of your hair. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that is that is somewhat important, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. By the yeah. way, this same person also called me uh, censorious. Uh, right? Censorious, I... meaning you want to censor something? Yes, right. Yes, that I'm. I like to censor things, and huh. I have no knowledge of this about myself. I've never heard this said of me. I that I, I don't like censoring anything. I'm a free speech sort of person. I I believe in uh, in in free speech. I'm not trying to silence anyone. I was raising objections about this film, and I don't. I was saying that I don't believe that it has any pedagogical value on a university campus. And for that reason, shouldn't be screened. It's not that I want to censor the movie. Anybody can watch the movie. I don't want it banned, but I don't think that a professor uh, at a university ought to use this because it has no teaching value. Absolutely. And we're going to show the trailer for the film in a few minutes and the attendant uh, poster that accompanies it. Um, I will say uh, first, oh, I should say even before that, that uh, in terms of free speech, ironically, both of us were just a few hours ago kicked off of the wall where this discussion had transpired um, over the past uh, 48 hours or so. And not one person addressed um, any of um, our questions. We were just. Well, that's not exactly true. Um, I did get uh, one person, in fact, the, the person that maintains the thread, who uh, wrote in uh, a very eloquent reply. Um, she said, um, yeah. Now, I'm not a political scientist, and she is, and you are. Is that a political science uh, term that I'm not familiar with? No, but I mean, I'm not uh, familiar with every aspect of my discipline. So okay. it might be something, you know, that 
I'm not aware of. Who knows what's going on now in the literature that I don't pay attention to? Well, she's in international relations, which isn't your field. So it's entirely possible that that's how they respond to certain things in international relations. Could be. I'm just a historian. What do I know? Anyways, um, the film that we're talking about is a film called Israelism, which is allegedly, and I stress the word allegedly, about uh, American Jewry's relationship with the state of Israel which of course has been covered numerous times in multiple films and uh, in books and in whatnot and whatever else. Um, it's obviously a major topic in the media. So it's an intriguing title for a film and based on that description alone, it might be something that I would wanna watch. Um, but here's the trailer and I'm going to uh, show the trailer on my monitor over here. Now here's where the technology, here's where the technology is going to start to fail me a little bit. Um, but I will do my best to render this. And we apologize in advance if it's a little bit choppy. Uh, blame it on YouTube, blame it on Zoom, just you know, don't blame it on us. Um, and here we go. I am going to turn on screen sharing right now. Once I find, here it is. Screen sharing. I want screen one shared and I want to share sound. Oh, maybe I didn't hit the optimize for video clip button last time when we tested. That could be it. Okay, here we go. And the movie will be on in two seconds. And here is the movie. Adam, can you see the movie? I see it, yeah. I don't see you, mind you, but that doesn't matter for the moment. Okay, mm -hmm. here we go, and I am going to play the clip. It's only a minute and 30 seconds. The non-Jewish community does not understand our obsession with Israel. Israel! Israel is Judaism, and Judaism is Israel. 10% of my Jewish high school joined the Israeli army. The first time I've been to the United States, Jewish Americans will tell me things like, we like you, but we don't like Palestinians. Even though I'm the only Palestinian they know. But then you come to realize that they know nothing about Palestinian and Palestinians or have no idea about what Palestinians are going through. When you go there, you see what non-democracy looks like up close. What we've been told is the only way that Jews can be safe is if Palestinians are not safe. The more I learned about that, the more I came to see that as a lie. They're really angry at the way that they were indoctrinated, and justifiably so. They don't want to see the cycle of hate perpetrated even by Jews themselves. There is an emerging awakening within the American Jewish community. Human will can change things. Wow. That's all I have to say for the moment is wow. Oh, you know what? I am going to bring... March 30th, 1980... We don't need to watch that. Yeah, that's not relevant. Did you show the flyer? Um, I will bring that up onto the screen um, right now. I'm still trying to find you. Um, you seem to have disappeared uh, entirely, um, which I guess is, is not the end of the world. I see um, you. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my, little, my little box died. It, it, it vanished. Let's see if I lower that, uh, minimize that. Where is the box? Where is the box? I have no idea. Um, I am going to pull up the flyer, mind you, right over here. And here we go. Here is the flyer that accompanies um, the film, um, mm -hmm. which is really remarkable in and of itself, but is far more striking once we consider it within the context of the actual of the actual uh, trailer that we just watched. Um, mm -hmm. So, what are your thoughts, Adam? What do you, what do you think of? I mean, you you, you look at this and uh, you see. Uh, you see a soldier with a with a gun on top of a guard tower with barbed wire, uh, you know, denoting, you know, kind of a concentration camp. It's obviously a very militant image that's being portrayed here. Uh, and then uh, in front of it, there's on top of it, there's uh, an American flag, uh, you know, which merges the um, American identity with the uh, Jewish identity. Uh, it's saying something about the American Jewish community. It isn't just talking about Israel. It's talking about American Jews in particular, and that we have a problem. 
Uh, it's painting American Jews as being hateful, as being jingoistic, as uh, being uh, very one-dimensional, uh, having a very common attitude with each other that's uh, very, uh, very nationalistic and hates Palestinians. Uh, it's it's a problematic uh, image that I'm seeing right here that they're using to promote this movie. The most, the thing that struck me most, and I didn't look at the poster until after I watched the trailer for the first time, uh, and it was part in part inspired by one of the comments that somebody put on uh, said professor of political science's wall, pointing out the uh, neo-fascist font that Israelism is written in, is that this is actually trying to convey the traditional anti-Semitic uh, stereotype of uh, Jewish disloyalty or of dual loyalty, right? That mm -hmm. the Jews are not actually loyal to the state within they live, but are either loyal to some sort of international Jewish cabal, which was the norm before, um, before Israel became a state. And then ever since Israel became a state, anti-Semites mm -hmm. on the left have said that Israel is more loyal to Israel than they are to the United States. This poster very much conveys that, right? You have the poster, you have the uh, soldier standing atop of the tower, basically overshadowing the, the American flag, standing over what might be considered a fascist uh, typeset. And mm -hmm. I would like to point out that Zionism and fascism are also likened to be uh, one and the same constantly um, by the left uh, in American politics and in American academia. So I think the message is pretty clear um, with that. If there's any doubt, um, then one need only look at the trailer with one of the quotes from there. 10% of my Jewish high school joined the Israeli army. Let's say, for example, that that may be true. I mean, if I were to do the math, I would say from my high school, our graduating class of 67, um, I, I think maybe three or four people ended up in the IDF um, in the end. Um, for a period of time. Well, a couple actually made Aliyah, but some went and came back. So let's assume for a second that figure is absolutely correct. And since this person was talking about their entire high school, um, I'm assuming they must have gone around and done a poll. I mean, how else would they know what people did in every grade? Um, mm -hmm. grade, nine, the grade 9, 10, 11, 12. Uh, sorry, ninth to 12th grade. I am from Canada. Excuse me. Um, so, but what is the point in even mentioning that? Is there something wrong with a Jew feeling proud of Israel and going to serve in their army to defend uh, the Jewish state against the people who want to wipe it off the face of the earth. I mean, Israel is a state. First of all, you know, we're assuming that her data is correct, which I think takes a major leap of faith because I have a very hard time believing that 10% of her high school joined the IDF. But let's assume that that's true. Um, your second question is is perfectly reasonable. Uh, you know, so what that that they uh, feel uh, a sense of, uh, of of Jewish identity and they feel a strong attachment to Israel and 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 Jewish people are not the only group that that would do something like that. Um, many different uh, you know people that are uh, part of a have some kind of ethnic or national identity. As even as Americans would feel that strongly attached to other countries that their you know ancestral lineage derives from, I don't see what makes Jews any different. Do you? Not at all. And I will bring up the obvious example here. Um, a year and a half ago, Russia invaded Ukraine, and Ukrainian Americans, Ukrainian Britons, Ukrainians from all over the diaspora actually went back to Ukraine to fight, and mm -hmm. they were universally cheered by the people on the left. Uh, mm -hmm. Their country was under assault um, by Russia, um, who, which wanted to annex territory it claimed belonged to them. So patriotic Ukrainians went back. Are they going to come back to America and be a fifth column? Do we need to worry about their loyalty being to Ukraine, to Ukraine being greater than their loyalty to America? I mean, when you say that on the surface, it sounds utterly absurd. I mean, why would they? What's wrong with even having, I don't even think loyalty is the proper word at play here. What's wrong with having an affiliation, an emotional affiliation, and even a military affiliation with two different states. Um, there, was an there was an interesting film produced uh, by uh, a relative of Steven Spielberg. I don't remember if it was his niece or his daughter or a third cousin five times removed, but we screened it here in Wilmington a number of years ago. It's called Above and Beyond, and it tracked uh, some American Air Force pilots who, after coming out of the Second World War, 
decided to go and help Israel when it was under assault by literally every neighboring Arab country. They were invaded from all sides. And at the time, contrary to popular belief, Israel got zero support from the United States at the time. Uh, the United States not only was neutral, but they imposed an arms embargo on the region. Obviously, Britain you know, was trying to pack up and get the hell out of there, and they were not going to be supporting Israel. They were, they'd had enough of the whole thing. Um, these American pilots... Uh, they never said in the film what percentage of them were Jewish, but uh, I'm assuming that a large percent of them were, went there um, because I suppose they felt some sort of emotional attachment and realized this underdog country was under assault and had absolutely no friends. At the time, it was illegal uh, in the United States to actually do that, and several of the participants had their citizenship stripped. And at least one of them was someone who was actually born in the United States. I have no idea how it's even legal to strip the citizenship um, of someone um, who was born in this country. But clearly, this smacks of the dual loyalty trope. So this is something that is not new. It is something that has been around for uh, 200 years, um, ever since the French Revolution, when Comte de Tonnerre said to the Jews as individuals everything, to the Jews as a nation nothing. And it's fodder for anti-Semites all across the political spectrum. That's the problem that I have, that it's a fodder for anti-Semites. And that's why uh, the filmmakers uh, need to be a lot more careful. The uh, Whoever produced this flyer needs to be a lot more careful. And the university professors that are screening it need to be a lot more careful. I mean, I believe that there is a, region, a, re a reasonable, legitimate debate that could be had about the line between one's loyalty to the United States versus another country. That is something that, you know, academically could be talked about, but this movie uh, is an all or nothing approach to that question. And that's what scares me. And it paints Jews in this light of, of not only dual loyalty, in fact, it's not even a dual loyalty, it's uh, it, an alternate loyalty. Like it's not, they're not loyal to the United States. They're only loyal to Israel. Yeah. And it What's, what's and, called and that, loyalty is really disloyalty. The term is actually exactly, disloyalty. exactly. It's disloyalty to the U.S. And you know, it it it, it to, when Gentiles see this movie, uh, this is what they what they're led to believe the Jewish community is like. Yeah, and, and the unfortunate and, problem is that the people who made this movie are Jewish, and quote Jewish studies experts have signed off on it. Um, and 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 you know, whenever something is put out by Jews. Uh, that paints Jews in a negative light. The anti-Semites hold on to that. They seize on to that. You know, yeah, that's yeah. that's something that they really hold dear. You know, and they, they use it as as uh, part of their propaganda techniques. I mean, even like say the um, that book by Walter Mearsheimer, the Israel Lobby. They make the claim in that book that we know that Israel is behind all of these evil things uh, because there's a, a small percentage of American Jews that say that they are. Yeah. And so they went on to say that whenever you have uh, a situation where a, 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 par, a fraction of, an, of a group of people say this about the larger percentage of their, of their group, then it has to be true, right? They actually make a causal connection there that we could actually call that data correct and accurate simply because it has been said by a small fraction. So similarly, you know, anti-Semites and people that necessarily aren't even anti-Semitic can look at this and, and say, well, you know, these are whistleblowers. If you have a small group of people saying yeah. this about their, the, you know, the larger population of people within their community, then they're blowing the whistle. And so there actually is something accurate about it. Imagine if Ukrainian Americans got up there, Ukrainian Americans in academia all got up there and said, uh, Ukraine is a state that's being run by fascists and neo-Nazis. And just, you know, left it at that. Even without mm -hmm. even going further, saying anything about Russia's invasion. Mm -hmm. People are going to take it seriously. And if they are experts in Ukraine, if they are of Ukrainian descent, obviously they know about their own homeland. Um, I wanted to add, uh, just in terms of that book, maybe people are not familiar with it. The book is called The Israel uh, Lobby by Walt and Mersheimer, two political scientists. I believe it probably came out between 15 and 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, the book basically alleges that the Israel Lobby controls American foreign policy. Um, and, uh, you know, to the point where it's influencing uh, what the U.S. does vis-a-vis -vis Iran, Iraq, you know, really taking it very far afield. It's not just about Israel itself. And mm -hmm. aside from what you mentioned, Adam, in terms of them saying, hey, Jews signed off on this, I noticed, and I signed part of the book in my anti-Semitism seminar once, um, on every second page, at least in the introduction, 
It says, look, we are not anti-Semites. Um, anti Criticizing Israel is not the same thing as anti-Semitism. And they mm -hmm. kept repeating it over and over and over again. If you need to repeatedly state that you are not anti-Semites, I mean, if you can't get that point across the first time, then there's a bit of a problem there. Maybe you are, in fact, being a little bit anti-Semitic. It's like people say, look, I'm not racist. Uh, what are you talking about? How can you possibly say that about me? Um, some of my best friends, you know, have served in the IDF. I mean, right. it is, right. is, is nuts. Um, well, that's what they keep I saying. Talk, but, but they keep saying that, but you know, then they make pictures like the film documentaries like this, which is not about Israel. It's about the American Jewish community. Absolutely. They're, this has nothing to do with criticism of Israel. There is no right. criticism of Israel whatsoever in this film. It's using anti-Semitic tropes, much as that recent statement, The Elephant in the Room, signed by over 2,100 people, authored by uh, the Penn State University Jewish Studies Program. It's pretty clear they're the ones who offered it, and they're trying to bring it into synagogues now as a, quote, project. Um, you read the first half of that statement, and it's, it's very alarmist and probably exaggerates a great deal, but it is basically condemning the current Israeli government. It doesn't even reject the two-state solution to the conflict. It says one state, two states, we don't care. We just need the situation to end now. Fair enough. I mean, they're exaggerating things. They use the word apartheid, which I don't agree with, but it has entered the vocabulary. Now, the bigger problem is the document then goes on to say that Jewish supremacy in Israel is being funded by American Jewish billionaires. So once again, you have it laid out, all these horrible things that Israel is allegedly doing. If they ended the document there, okay, fine. It's an anti-Israel screed, but it has nothing to do with America, the American Jewish community. But then suddenly in the second half, they're implicating American Jewry and basically saying, were it not for this wealthy cabal of Jews, obviously they're not going to use the word cabal, but billionaires, you know, it's one and the same for all intents and purposes, is funding, and they deploy the phrase Jewish supremacy. Now, again, in terms of phrasing here, the use of Jewish supremacy is a major, major problem. Apartheid, I don't agree that Israel is an apartheid state. Um, a lot of people will make that claim. Um, and I, but I have no interest in really even entering into a debate with it, because although apartheid is obviously regarded as a universal evil, with the only other state in history being labeled that, South Africa, um, at the very least, there is sheer hypocrisy here because there are dozens of states that should be called apartheid if they're using an expansive definition of it that would fall under you know, the rubric in this case. So there's a double standard there. Now, there's a big difference though between using the word apartheid and using uh, the phrase Jewish supremacy because apartheid doesn't have a long history of being associated with anti-Semitism, whereas Jewish supremacy does. There is absolutely no excuse for anyone, especially uh, if they're you know, presenting it before the proverbial goyim, right? they're saying this to non-Jews, to use a phrase used by David Duke and used by the Nazis to exterminate one third of world Jewry during the Holocaust. That is Jewish supremacy. So even if one were to argue um, that these are Jewish na religious nationalists who want to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians out of the West Bank, and I'm not conceding that that is true here, but let's just say for a second that that's true, even if that is true, you don't use the phrase Jewish supremacy in that context. You find different vocabulary. You don't I use agree with you that, I agree with you that the that the phrase Jewish supremacy is worse than the phrase apartheid because of what it conjures up. Uh, but I, I'm not giving the term apartheid a pass. I will always debate that. Um, I mean, Absolutely. I, I agree with you. And it should be debated. But it's mm -hmm. not, it doesn't have that same lineage that same yes, who will, that is so deeply connected to the extermination of the Jewish people. It, it, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, if you, were, if you were a Jewish person and you were using that phrase, you are using it deliberately in order to invoke suspicion and hatred against American Jewry, if that's where it's directed. And um, they're counting on that. They're counting on American Jews cowering before them because they want to remake American Jewry in their image an image that is pal palatable to the uh, so to the social activist left today. And that is really- They also use the phrase Jewish hegemony too. That's common as well. Yeah, hegemony is, and there's one professor who I shall not name because we're not going to you know, be mean to name people. He started to switch to hegemony after more than just me, you know, more than just I called him out on using the phrase Jewish supremacy. Like, okay, I'm not going to say that. Let me use the phrase hegemony. You know, maybe if you hadn't said supremacy in the first place, then you could have gotten away with it. But at this point, you know, it's a dog whistle. It's a euphemism. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we can tell at this point. 
Um, there are a few other quotes from this movie that I think we should talk about, but I want to I want to throw in one remark here that we didn't say before we started. Neither Adam nor I has seen the movie, and our critics might say, well, you really need to watch the movie here before you critique it. Um, that might be true to a certain extent in terms of critiquing the movie itself, but I will point out that the vast majority of people who will encounter this film will not actually go and see the film. They will come across the poster, and they will perhaps watch, you know, if their attention span can last, they will watch a minute and a half trailer um, on the internet. And a very small percentage will actually go and watch the film, unless it ends up streaming on Netflix at some point down the road. But for the moment, that's, that's not the case. Now, given that that's the case, I think the message being sent out via the poster and the trailer is far more important than what might be in the movie itself. And one might add that if the movie is, you know, significantly different than the trailer, you have to wonder why would they be producing a trailer like this? I have a hard time believing that the movie is significantly different from the trailer. Yeah. yeah. And, and if it is, then this is a rotten marketing strategy for the movie, right? Yeah, absolutely. I guess they're trying to lure people in, expecting to see something anti-Semitic. Um, but let's just assume that 90% that ninety percent of the people who encounter the movie are going to do so through that uh, that's really blatant dual loyalty poster. Um, and disloyalty poster and the trailer. Uh, I want to point out uh, Dr. Jeffrey Herf, who's really one of the best Holocaust historians in the United States, wrote an amazing book called The Jewish Enemy, which focused on the propaganda that Nazi Germany used uh, between, really between 1939, well, really from 1933 right through the war. Um, and one of the points that he makes in the book is that for Hitler to have pulled off what he did, for Germans, at the very least, to kind of look the other way and say, okay, whatever, I don't care what happens to the Jews, they're a bit of a problem. He needed to, Hitler needed to establish what Herf calls an anti-Semitic consensus. That means the German population had to go from what they were in 1933, which was at worst indifference to the Jewish population. They really weren't thinking of them much. They were 1% of the population of Germany. Yeah, they had some leading roles in many positions. On the other hand, people had Jewish lawyers, had Jewish doctors. You know, they weren't being poisoned by their Jewish doctors. They had no reason to distrust the Jews. So Hitler established an anti-Semitic consensus, and he did this through propaganda, right? And that propaganda took the form of posters, such as the one that was used for this movie trailer, and um, wall, newspa wall newspapers, which is what I think the term he uses to describe them. Back in those days, not everyone sat around and read newspapers, even though obviously Germany had a very high literacy rate at that point, unlike, let's say, Russia. And people encountered these uh, wall newspapers when they were waiting for a train, when they were waiting for a bus, they'd be hanging everywhere. And they might not even read the whole story. They would just read the headlines and look at the pictures. And if you're bombarded with that for six years, eventually you're gonna be indoctrinated and you're gonna come to hate the Jews, or at the very least, think that the Jews are perhaps a problem. And if they were to just kind of disappear one night and you don't, you know, you don't see what happens, then it's okay. So Hitler achieved his anti-Semitic consensus using the tools that these filmmakers have used. So this is my little uh, justification for us not having to actually watch the movie to be able to critique what we were exposed to this week. Um, there are a few quotes in the movie um, that we should discuss, aside from the 10% of my uh, Jewish high school joined the Israeli army, which we've already talked about, but there's a few others. Um, I think uh, before, before you get to that, though, uh, have you, I, I noticed something on this viewing uh, that I didn't before. Uh, that they're, they're trying to conjure up some sort of attachment to the right wing in the United States with some of the footage that they selected, like the, 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 the march through the street. Mm -hmm. You can easily see that it's in front of the Trump Tower. Right. Oh, they, I didn't even notice that. I'm yeah. Right. So yeah. they they want to they want to uh, they want to bring in that image that it's somehow uh, you know a right wing Republican conspiracy involved somehow in this. Yeah. No. And I will I will point out when um, I was uh, conscripted into the Jewish Studies Activist Network, not the Zionist Network, the Activist Network back in 2017, and their goal was to quote fight fascism in America. And you know, although I didn't buy the whole Trump is a fascist line, I still recognized that white supremacy was a problem. And I said, well, yeah, I don't believe in hounding immigrants at the border or, or you know attacking minorities. I'm, I'm a Canadian here on a green card, so why wouldn't I join such a group? But it became clear, you know, very soon that this group had an agenda, and that was very much an anti-Zionist agenda. And as one person from the group, um, who I, I won't name, he's a professor of, of, of Jewish studies, 
uh, who I have a very low opinion of, uh, he literally trolled and harassed me, harassed me on Facebook for three days that week. And I kept leaving my computer. My parents were in town. I kept coming back and I said, you're still here. But there was one quote that he had in that exchange. And I'm trying to get the words exactly right. And they say, the purpose of this group is to bring down the BB Trump alliance or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. right? He was presenting Israel as being as much of a problem as Trumpism in America. Which mm -hmm. is something that, you know, everyone on the left would say at the time was a problem, whether you or I think Trump is a problem or not is immaterial to this discussion. But that is something that was universally accepted on the left, even among people who did not really think about Israel very often. And there are a lot of people on the left who probably don't think about Israel very often. But this was a technique of theirs to really center Israel as part of the problem by talking mm -hmm. about the Trump BB alliance, um, as he put it. So it was very much a, um, an awakening or perhaps an... It's very, it's very clear that the filmmakers here knew their audience and knew yeah. the kind of things that it would evoke. Uh, this is not a film that's geared towards uh, people that are Trump supporters, people that are, uh, you know, who don't believe that, you know, uh, the MAGA movement is fascist. It's, yeah. it's designed to scare those people who, yeah. who do who don't like Trump and the, and do uh, oppose the MAGA movement, yeah, uh, you know, by by lumping Israel in with alongside it, yeah, by suggesting that um, anti-Semitism is somehow a major, no, not anti-Semitism, but that fascism and Israel are linked, and therefore Jews mm -hmm. in America um, are linked. Right. To it would lead to the social activist left, who are not particularly anti-Zionist, even though most of them are at this point because they have been doing, the anti-Zionists have been doing stuff like this for, for over a decade now. Um, but it would reinforce that idea that fascism is a problem in America, and perhaps the Jews, the quote not, they wouldn't say the Jews, but the Zionists are a major problem. The, the, the selection that they took, you know, they these, these look like very right-wing Jews that, that are protesting in front of the Trump Tower. But you and I both know that, you know, there's lots of, uh, events on behalf of, of Israel pride in Jewish communities across the country yeah. where there's people, it's a very diverse look, a, a, a array of, of looks of the, of the people that, that are involved from across the entire spectrum of what people could look like. Uh, but they selected very selectively yeah. people that would inspire that kind of fear in their audience. On that point, with in terms of diversity and support for Israel, um, during the summer of 2017, and this is another incident that led to my altercation with the Jewish Studies Activist Network. You can read all about it in my uh, recent piece in the Jewish Journal if you want. But uh, there was an Israel uh, Day Parade in New York. I think it happens every year in, uh, in May or June. And uh, Jewish Voice for Peace, who I will say right now are anti-Semites, and their purpose is to liquidate the state of Israel and replace it with Palestine by painting Israel and its supporters in the most evil light possible. And, you know, I could talk about this for a half an hour, but I won't. I've written about it, as have other people. Um, they decided to go and disrupt the event. How did they decide or who did they decide to target? They targeted a contingent of gay Jews, mm -hmm. not only gay Jews gay Orthodox Jews. And anyone knows that in traditional Orthodox communities, especially ultra-Orthodox, you cannot be openly gay. I mean, this is something that they don't they don't support. I mean, you, you, so a lot of these people probably lived in fear for much of their lives. And this might have been, you know, a great moment for them, coming out for the very first time as proud Jews, as proud Zionists, and openly gay. But Jewish Voice for Peace knew that, well, if you're going to, uh, you know, cause a major disruption, you want to go after the most vulnerable. Everyone knows that's how you fight a war. So they went after the gay Orthodox Jews. Now let's be clear here. This has absolutely nothing to do with the state of Israel. This has nothing to do with Zionism. This has nothing to do with the Palestinians whatsoever. This has to do with targeting vulnerable Jews in the United States in order to scare the Jewish community into mm -hmm. dropping Israel and then following the social activist party line, which in the tradition of all anti-Semites is to you know, if we're going to allow the Jews to continue to exist, we are going to mold the Jews in our image, an image that is acceptable. And that image includes, you know, Jews devoid of power. And that means the state of Israel has to go. Mm -hmm. 
So there are a couple of other quotes in the movie um, that we uh, should talk about, and I wrote down four of them. Uh, we talked about the 10% of my Jewish high school joined the Israeli army. There's two quotes here on the Palestinians, um, which are really um, intriguing. One of them is, we like you, but we don't like Palestinians. And that quote right. was uttered the by... The Palestinian some... guy says that this is what he's told by yeah. Jews when he came to the United States. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? I mean, I have a, 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 a Palestinian chicken restaurateur. Uh, I can easily reference the Curb Your Enthusiasm mm -hmm. episode, the Palestinian chicken. But I, I joke with them all the time. You know, I said, you know, for an Arab, you're okay. You know, so you're, for a Palestinian, you're all right. But obviously, I'm not being serious about it. And he said to me, you know, for a Jew, you're pretty good. You're okay. I like you. Here, I'll give you free French fries tonight. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea that, you know, this, first of all, how did this Palestinian end up with a group of right-wing Jews in the first place? And mm -hmm. how is it that um, they would say that? I, I really don't... I, I'm very skeptical. I have a very hard time believing that a single American Jew, or even an Israeli Jew, or at least not too many of them, uh, said that to him. I have a very hard time believing it. Yeah, no, so do I. I, I, say, I say liar, liar, hair on fire. Liar, liar, hair on fire. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other quote... And this is a really intriguing quote also. What we've been told is that the only way for Jews to be safe is for Palestinians to be not safe. What we've been told is that the only way for Jews to be safe is for Palestinians to be not safe. I went to a hardcore conservative Zionist Jewish day school, okay? I can assure you that that was never said to us. Uh, in fact, the quote is mathematically impossible because my Hebrew teachers, and I think this is true until this very day in the conservative Zionist schools, don't even recognize the existence of a Palestinian nation. They wouldn't use the word Palestinian, right? They would refer to them as Arabs. That's how they refer to them throughout my education. And I only learned, oh, there actually is a group called the Palestinians when I, I took a course at university on, on the conflict. So, I mean, no, that in and of itself. It's not shocking to me that in some sectors of Jewish communities, you may hear uh, that, that, you know, that, that Israel needs to be prioritized over the Palestinian people. That would not surprise me if that's said in some communities, but that's not exactly the same thing as saying that Palestinians need to be unsafe uh, for, for, for Jews to be safe. There's a difference. Absolutely. I could even see, you know, Jewish school saying, you know, uh, for now, you know, we need to occupy um, the West Bank. I'm not mm -hmm. saying the occupation, but we need to occupy the uh, West Bank for purposes of Israeli security, given how small Israel is and given how many times the Arab states have invaded Israel, and given how much terrorism was committed by the Palestinians uh, throughout the 1970s. I'm stating things here as empirical factor. I'm not taking sides in any way whatsoever mm -hmm. on any of these issues and what's going on in Israel. But nobody would have ever said we need to keep the Palestinians unsafe. They might say we need to contain them. But they would never use the word unsafe, which implies mm -hmm. that Israel is deliberately, no, it's not even implying that Israel deliberately terrorizes them. Mm -hmm. It's that Israel mm -hmm. requires the terror exactly. to right. terrorize the Palestinian in you order know, for and, Jews to be safe. And and also, you know, while I, I can see, like I said, some sectors saying something, you know, like, you know, that, that for the mean, in the meantime, you know, we need to have uh, settlements in the West Bank, or uh, we need to prioritize uh, Israel over Palestine, that I could see, but only some sectors, I would say that the vast majority of the American Jewish community is very unhappy with uh, the current status quo in Israel and wants a change, right? Um, so I, I just, I have a hard time believing that such a quote is representative of the American Jewish community. I would like, most Jews want to see an end to the conflict. Most Jews in the United States want to see some kind of two-state solution. Most Jews want to see peace in, in the Middle East. Yeah. If you ask it, almost any Jew in the United States, that's what they would say. And also what's interesting is that the, um, the anti-Zionist own data even confirms this. I mean, I saw an article in the Jewish Currents that was playing up uh, the Pew poll uh, that was showing that, uh, you know, the American Jewish community is very split on the question of Israel, right? And, and there are generational differences. The younger G Generation Z and much of the millennials uh, tend to favor uh, some kind of two-state solution and perhaps even a binational solution that would incorporate Jews and uh, Palestinians under one state. The Peter, so, Beinart, the Peter Beinart fantasy. 
Exactly, right. But nevertheless, that, that Peter Beinart fantasy is gaining a fair amount of traction yeah. uh, in, in the Jewish community. Now, I don't necessarily, oh, I don't agree with that position. I don't agree with it. It won't work. Look at the history of multinational yeah. states. I'm an expert exactly. in history. Exactly. Nor, nor do I think, for me, that it's desirable. Like, I want to see a Jewish state. That is my personal position. And it is the personal position of a lot of Jews in the American Jewish community. But it's not the totality of the American Jewish viewpoint. All I am saying, and the film completely ignores this important point, is that the Jewish community in the United States is hardly monolithic, right? There is a tremendous amount of viewpoint diversity among American Jews. And this movie makes it seem like, you know, all American Jews have this fascist mentality that they're being indoctrinated in since they're, you know, since they were in a header or something. Actually, to be more precise, it paints the Jewish community in binary terms. There are these, you know, wacko uh, right-wingers who are the normative aspect of the community. And then there's this new group who are rising up, you know, represented by Peter Beinart and apparently Simone Zimmerman, who's on the poster, and is an activist best known for her work on If Not Now, which deliberately disrupted birthright trips, mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, PR stunt that did not go over too well a number of years ago. So yeah, they're, they're uh, binary, they're, but but that position though, uh, I think for the film seems to be uh, again we're on seeing the film. It's just the trailer makes it seem like it's a small percentage. Yeah, and it's hardly a small percentage. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the other quote, and uh, I know I had more of a problem with it than you did, um, but but it is an outright lie. Um, Judaism is Israel, and Israel is Judaism. They don't give much context for it at the beginning, but I'm assuming that the person who is speaking, and I have no idea who she is, is what that's was her experience at Jewish day school, or that was based on the evidence she gathered about Jewish day schools, that that's what Jews are taught at uh, Jewish day schools. Now, again, I will stress that I went to the typical conservative Zionist Jewish day school. Um, granted, it was in Canada, not the United States, but it was the Solomon Schachter system for elementary school. And it was uh, Herzliya High School um, after elementary school. Now, yes, we sang Hatikva every morning. Of course, it didn't make me want to run off and go serve the IDF and betray my country. Uh, I thought it a little bit strange that we were singing a national anthem for a different country. You know, I mean, obviously that struck me as a little bit odd. Um, but, you know, we didn't just learn about Israel. We were taught that Israel was fundamentally necessary um, for the Jews for security reasons. We were taught that it was an intrinsic part of our identity, that we were yearning to go home for 2,000 years. Obviously, once you get into the weeds of the history of Jewish history, that's not exactly true. Yes, we got a very simplistic education, but that was the place um, of Zionism in the education. It was fundamental to it. But... To say that Judaism is Israel and Israel is Judaism, they're not even saying Jewishness is Israel. They're using the word Judaism here, which implies that that's it for religion. Judaism for this normative Jewish community in the United States as they're presenting it yeah. is the worship of Israel and nothing else. Well, why did we study the Bible four days a week? Um, why did we go and pray three times a week? And these are not prayers to the state of Israel. We did other things that Jews did. We built uh, sukkahs and we celebrated Simchat Torah. We did all the holidays and they were not given a Zionist narrative, right? I mean, we didn't have a Zionist narrative on Yom Kippur and uh, my school took that holiday. Oh, there, is a, there is a prayer for Israel in the uh, conservative and reform sidurs. Right. Um, but, you know, that that I guess is a minor quibble. Uh, but Which is uh, fine. I, but you're not going to the synagogue and saying, OK, here, read the Declaration of Independence and we'll put in something about God here at the end of it. All right. Mm -hmm. No, they're saying they have a, obviously there should be a prayer for Israel. Why not? What's wrong with that? Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. But I mean, it's something I suppose that if you're defending that quote, if they're defending that quote, they could point to as some kind of evidence. Look, I went to an Orthodox day school. Uh, and uh, for, for, for two years, for seventh grade and eighth grade. And I uh, don't recall Israel ever really mentioned very often. Uh, when it was mentioned, it was usually in the context of some teacher or rabbi or uh, a parent of a student who uh, was off to Israel for a couple of days, a couple of weeks or something, and then would be back, right? We're talking about their visit to Israel and then come back and tell us about it. But there was very, very little discussion about Israel. Otherwise, 
Uh, there were no Israeli flags anywhere on campus. Oh, really? uh, we, we did not sing Hatikva at the, at the school. Um, so uh, I, I had a very different experience on that. Was it, was it traditional Orthodox or was very it traditional, Orthodox? Very traditional, traditional Orthodox. Yes. Yeah. But it wasn't Not, modern Orthodox. Modern Orthodox. Modern Orthodox. Okay. Yeah. And there's obviously various streams of that. Um, you know, I, I've been around Chabad uh, most of my life, not really by choice. I, I have Chabad in my family. So I've had it shoved in my face for much of my life. I go to Chabad also very, very often. I have a, I mean, my experience with Judaism is very much through Chabad. Uh, at least in my adult life. I mean, too, to a certain extent, yes. We rarely in, at Chabad's uh, have, have discussed Israel. They almost never do. And you know what? Last Friday, I went to Chabad for dinner with the local rabbi's place. It was a very nice, very smart man. And there were mm -hmm. even three Israelis who were in town visiting. I think they'd served in the Marines here. Oh, my God, maybe they're not loyal to Israel anymore. You know, they're, they're on some sort of Marine exchange program in the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they came there. And even though there were Israelis sitting in the room, when the rabbi, and he always gives his little, uh, his little speech um, before we eat or, or after we eat, um, it's always about God. It's always about God and whatever the Torah uh, parsha is for that particular week. He didn't say a single word about Israel, not one. Even when I brought up the Jewish Zionist network to him and gave him our business card, he said, that looks very interesting. I'll we'll check it out. That was the extent of it. And I was mm -hmm. explaining yeah. the situation on college campuses. Chabad is not founded. It certainly wasn't founded on it. They were actually anti-Zionists if you go far back uh, enough in their history. But mm -hmm. for them, Israel is. It's part of Jewish identity, but it's not their focus. And Chabad accounts for a large percentage of how Jews in the United States engage with Judaism, given how much outreach um, they do, on college campuses in particular. So again, we keep throwing these different parts of the Jewish... You know, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Schneerson, never even went to Israel. Oh, really? He was never there? Yeah, never, he never went there. Yeah, yeah I mean... Yeah. Look, the Hasids, if you go back in their history, they were militantly anti-Zionist when they started. Well, he wasn't. He just he he argued that uh, the, the Torah requires that once you go to Israel, you can't leave. And he felt that he can't emigrate there. He has a lot of work to do in New York. So he never well, left. I know a lot of Chabad who go back and forth all the time. So I guess those, those words <laughs> uh, didn't, didn't stick. Right. But, but I, I, I do want to ask you a question, though, uh, to, to, bring, to this, uh, in a small way, maybe challenge your objection to that quote. Okay. Uh, so how, how is this any any different then? I'll ask you to defend it from uh, your um, you know your 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 uh, defense of the unjew article that Sharansky and Gil Troy wrote uh, because uh, the ar that that argument that they that they made in their tablet article on the emergence of the unjew is that um, by um, uh, by being staunchly anti-Zionist and changing the way that we understand uh, our relationship with Israel, that they're trying to do something to negate the way in which we do Judaism. So uh, by your own admission, it seems like you do think that uh, being a Jew is very much about Israel. It's a core component of how people define their Jewishness today. Absolutely. Um, normative, I don't want to use the word Judaism, but normative Jewishness, the pillars of identity of how American Jews define themselves, Israel is a key component. That doesn't mean it is for everyone. I'd say a very large percentage of American Jews are what you would call non-Zionists. Um, they don't really think, I think my ex-wife would fall into that category. You know, they were raised with Holocaust consciousness and with traditions. Are they happy Israel's there? Well, they probably really haven't given it much thought. But I think at the end of the day, they probably would be, you know, in case, uh, you know, we have to pack our suitcases and flee again. Now, here's the thing. Judaism or Jewishness is always in flux, especially in the modern world. Uh, the components of Jewish identity change over time. Even throughout the Middle Ages, they did, though it's not as obvious on the surface because Talmudic Judaism governs uh, daily life um, throughout, especially in the Ashkenazi world but to a large extent in the Sephardic and Mizrahi world as well. Um, but with modernity um, and first the emergence of the Haskalah and then eventually Zionism and then the triumph of Israel, which occurred simultaneously with the Holocaust, made <laughs> Jews very aware that um, we are an ethno-national community. You know, if modernity forced us to choose being, you know, between being a religion or an ethnic nation, I think the mid 20th century said, well, if you're going to have to choose between the two, you're an ethnic nation. But obviously, I'm not saying religion is negated here. The point is that um, if you were to look at the late 20th century, um, what are the pillars of Jewish identity? That doesn't mean that people have to engage with each and every one of these pillars, but these are ways that Jews engage, intrinsic ways that Jews engage with uh, Jewishness at this point. You have um, going to synagogue, 
you have keeping other laws, such as keeping kosher and whatnot. Um, you have observing the holidays. Um, you have learning Hebrew to connect um, with the language um, of your forefathers. You have Yiddishkeit, you have Yiddish culture, um, which is a very legitimate way to define your Jewishness, absolutely. And now you have Israel. So when they use the term un-Jew, they are saying that they're undoing, undoing Jewish identity, because these are all, um, you know, pillars and aspects of Jewish identity. Oh. And they're actually going after the people for whom Israel is a key component of their identity. So they're mm -hmm. unmaking what American Jewish identity in its totality is today. And they're trying to refashion it in their image. I will give you the parallel uh, with the early Soviet period. Um, there was a group called the Jewish Section of the Communist Party, or the Yevsyaksia in Russian. And they were former, former people from the Bundist Party, the Jewish labor movement, who made the mistake of joining the Bolsheviks after the revolution, not realizing what lay on the horizon for them when Stalin would come around. But they were tasked with bring, bringing the revolution to the Jewish street. Trotsky wanted to have nothing to do with it. He said, I don't want to work with Jews. You know, I got better things to do. I, got, you know, I just won the civil war for us. So these guys were out to fashion the Soviet Jew, if you will. And they had an image of what the Soviet Jew was supposed to be and what he was not supposed to be. And what they were supposed to be, or first, let's do what they were not supposed to be. They were not supposed to be Zionist. They were not supposed to be speaking Hebrew. And they were not supposed to be worshipping um, Judaism because the Soviet Union was an atheist state. So religion was bad across the board. But so was ethnic nationalism, unless it was expressed within the context of the USSR. Now, they had an image of the, quote, good Jew, just as the social justice left has an image of the good Jew today. But for the Bolsheviks, the good Jew was a Yiddish speaker, because Yiddish was the language of the Jewish proletariat, right? Um, he worked in factories. He produced Yiddish culture that, you know, even would even celebrate, let's say, the Maccabees. But of course, it would be through the prism of the, cla the class conflict. The Maccabees were the proletariat, and the Greeks were the bourgeoisie that needed to be overthrown. This is like a direct quote out of the Soviet textbook I'm giving you here. So these guys, too, were undoing Jewish identity. I'm not sure un-Jew un would be the word that I would necessarily choose here. Um, I think it's more of refashioning Jewishness, oh. an image that is palatable to whatever regime they are speaking to at the time. Um, but they did decimate Jewish identity for a large percentage of the people who were living in the Soviet Union, and at that point, getting out was a little bit tricky. So I'll, I'll defend the term un-Jew here. My question, though, is uh, if, in fact, by your own admission, Israel is one of the pillars of Jewishness, why is this quote problematic? Then, therefore, it's correct, right, that Judaism is Israel. No, because Judaism is, is that Israel, it should be Israel is a component of Judaism. That's what it should be. Or Jews is a component of Israelism, if you want to put it the, the, the flip side, but it's a component. It's not it in and of itself. I won't say that it's the most important thing. Um, in many respects, it's one of the most important things for me, uh, because I'm, for all intents and purposes, an atheist. I only go to synagogue if I happen to be the speaker. Otherwise, I really don't like praying. Um, Rumor has it that I once walked by a Chabad house drinking a smoothie on Yom Kippur, but that's not really my fault that the YMCA, you know, opened up next to the Chabad house or, or vice versa. So Israel is a way that I engage with um, with my Jewish heritage. And if people were to tell me that that is wrong and try to violently or not violently, but through pressure, face that aspect of my identity, that would be undoing my Jewish identity. It absolutely would be. So I, I think it is a legitimate term. And that, that quote is really suggesting that the quote, Israel applies to you. The, the, the quote applies to you, and I think it applies to a lot of Jews, right, like you uh, in that respect. The problem is it doesn't apply to the entire gamut of the American Jewish community. Right. But I still think, nevertheless, they would have issues if people came around and tried to liquidate Israel. I think there are people who, if subjected to a litmus test, um, as they're doing at the Berkeley Law Clubs now, where mm -hmm. if you are someone who's going to speak there— they're going to possibly subject you to a litmus test on where you stand in Israel. First of all, how are they going to know who's, who, who should be subjected or not? I assume they're going to just subject people who they think are Jewish. And I think when push comes to shove, a large percentage of American Jews who I would classify as non-Zionists would not want to renounce Israel if they were forced to do so. It's forcing them to become anti-Zionists or to express anti-Zionism against their will. So, you know, I would argue that these anti-Zionists, the equivalent of that would be what the Yusyaxia did in terms of shutting down the synagogues. So imagine there's a large percentage of Jews who, let's say, call themselves uh, Jews for atheism or whatever else, 
who mm -hmm. didn't have a problem with Israel, but had a problem with synagogue worship because mm -hmm. there was no God, because the religion is misogynistic, yada, yada, whatever you want to call it. And then went down and started propagating in public that these synagogues are spreading religious fundamentalism that is a threat to American society. And they actually were trying to, to you know, shut down synagogues in as much as that's possible in the United States. Um, they well, are also undoing Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. Well, for the reasons you just described, I have less of a problem actually with that quote, because I think it is safe to say, for the reasons that you described, that Israel is in some way conceived as being a very important part of Jewish not only identity, but destiny, the destiny of the Jewish people in some way is attached to Israel, not necessarily in the state of Israel today, but somehow with Israel. Okay, that, well, that's actually intrinsic to Jewish theology. Okay, so they're undoing it. it theology of exile, the Messiah comes, we're not going up to heaven in the sky, we are returning to Zion. Yeah. That's right? why it's it, called Zionism, right? Yeah, it's connected to the land. So if that's what actually they're attacking, then they really are undoing Judaism. But the quote is not Judaism is Israel. It's, it's I don't think that that quote is meant to imply J Israel in the messianic sense. I really don't. I think they're talking about Israel, the state, and worship the state of Israel. Yeah. I think that's safe to say. Yeah. Yes. But uh, but I be, I I could see it though the quote making sense uh, in other contexts if it wasn't this particular film using it. Right. But the context here is this trailer and this yeah. and this uh, poster for the film. Which, I uh, I, let's just say it this way. I believe that I have a much uh, easier time believing that this person who said that has heard that in Jewish communities. But I have not, I, I have a hard time believing that these other quotes are actually things that any of these people are witness to. Yeah, I think it's all a pack of lies uh, or a very, very selective reading of what they might have heard here and there. I, I, no, I don't think there is any integrity or honesty um, in the production uh, of this film and the dissemination um, of it. And of course, there's the Abraham Foxman thing, which uh, we probably should wrap things up here, but let's yeah. talk about Foxman. Um, for those of you who were attuned to the trailer, you'll note that Abraham Foxman, former head of the a ADL, who was certainly further to the right than the current head of the ADL, uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, um, was being interviewed in the film saying how important Israel is to Jewish identity. Now, why would someone like Foxman, who is militantly against anti-Zionism. Why would he why would he agree to be interviewed in this film? He wouldn't if he knew what the film was going to be about. Right. And but he was allegedly told, I use the word allegedly because neither of us were actually privy to any of this, but he was allegedly told according to him and, and everyone that agrees with what he has said on both sides that this would be a film about the relationship between American Jews and Israel. But what, is, what does that mean, right? That could be, you know, just a very neutral exploration of the topic. But he had no idea that this was actually going to be a film that would paint American Jews in this bad, negative light. As and sort of, we should yeah. add that Foxman has tweeted that he was duped, that he had apps he would have never yeah. participated in this film um, had he known what its true purpose was. And you, um, on that on said political scientist's Facebook wall, you made, I think, an analogy that worked quite well. Um, mm -hmm. And what was the analogy again that you made with? Well, I, I said, well, well, suppose you know you have a pro-life filmmaker that is making a movie about uh, you know the evils of abortion, and then they go to uh, the president of Planned Parenthood and uh, ask that person uh, to sit down for an interview to be in the movie. I'm hey, I'm doing a movie on on abortion, right? Would you like to be in it? Oh sure, you know anything to you know to talk about abortion and all that. Uh, so they sit down and they do they make the movie and then it's selectively edited into this film about the you know taking the the pro life position on it. Uh, and then suddenly after the the film is out, you know the the president of Planned Parenthood is, you know finds out that actually they sat down and agreed to be an interview and in an interview for a movie that was on the direct opposite side of what they would have been in. Yeah, and that's what Borat you know, has done in all his work, Sasha Baron Cohen, but of um, course that was for the purposes of satire, right? It wasn't, it wasn't deadly serious like this. And um, so you posted this on said political scientist wall and, and how, and how did they respond again to it? Um, all right. So we're back at the um here. So that's the only yeah. explanation they could have for such an analogy. I, I thought it was a very good analogy. I thought it made perfect sense. 
Um, so maybe we should wrap things up with with um, uh, but before yeah. we go, we should mention once again uh, the Jewish Study Zionist Network, um, which we founded last summer, and uh, I invite everyone to check out um, our website. Actually, let's see. I put the QR code here. It'll be interesting. Yeah, if they maybe can they could scan the QR code. That'd be pretty cool if that worked. Yeah. Is that clear enough? Yeah, you can't see the small print, but the big print is, you know, you can see that. In. No, it's got to be further out. Okay. Well, give it a shot. If not, the URL is... Maybe they can see more. Well, a little blurry, but anyways, the URL is jszznetwork.org. And you can read our mission statement, which has gotten over 190 signatures from Jewish study scholars who are pushing back against the anti-Zionist line that is being imposed on the academy um, with indoctrination through terms like Jewish supremacy, genocide, apartheid state, and whatever else with very little evidence to back up any of these claims. Most importantly, you know, these professors are not giving ample space to the other side for open debate, for critical inquiry. And this really alarmed us. It is an activist network um, in the sense that we are trying to push back against um, what's going on in academia at the moment, but we are very much for freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and most importantly, scholarly integrity. We are all for everyone expressing their views, and our group does not have a unified position on politics, especially Israeli politics. The group would fall apart in 30 seconds. I'm sure I disagree with you on dozens of things, not even to mention American politics, but on, on Israeli politics. So this is all about you know, all about fair scholarship toward Israel. And the one political criteria is you have to recognize um, Israel is an expression of Jewish ethno-national self-determination. Uh, so if you say um, 1948 is a racist endeavor and nothing else, well, right there and then, no, you're not doing the bare minimum that you're basically, mm -hmm. uh, you need to do to be part of our network, um, which is that you could study Israel in all sorts of ways, but you can't say this was an imperialist racist project from the start and didn't represent anything else whatsoever, right? This is a legitimate expression of national self Which a person wouldn't want to join anyway. If they exactly, were. yeah. And, you know, even if you think ethno-national self-determination is wrong and that there shouldn't be ethnic national states, which would make you, you know, an anti-Zionist and not an anti-Semite, um, the point is that this is the norm in the world today. So to suggest that it's okay for these other places, for Pal a Palestinian nation state to come into being, and for a Jewish nation state to not exist, that's, you know, you're subjecting Israel to a double standard mm -hmm. and using all sorts of tropes from the anti-Semitic arsenal um, to back that up. So we invite readers to uh, check out our site or watchers to check out our site. We've issued quite a few statements, um, including one um, impugning the Association for Jewish Studies last year, because in their uh, social justice issue of their quarterly magazine perspectives, they published something that uh, this quote art installation that quite explicitly uh, compared Gaza to Auschwitz. We're not talking about Gaza to the Warsaw Ghetto, which even that would be you know, wrong. We're talking about the Auschwitz, which was literally an industrialized machinery of death, unprecedented in history and has yet to be replicated. People were sent there to die in gas chambers and to be cremated and, uh, and burnt. Okay, And somehow that is reflective of what's going on in, in Gaza. That falls into the category of what Professor Deborah Lipstadt has defined as Holocaust revisionism trivializing the Holocaust by saying, but what about the suffering of these people? And what about these people? And clearly the purpose here is to say that the Palestinians have suffered just as much as the Jews and the Jews are, you know, forcing the whole world to pay attention to the suffering they endured at the Holocaust and using this victimhood to justify what they do in Israel. So it's pretty horrible. And it led to a walkout of dozens of people from the Association of Jewish Studies at the time. Any closing remarks? Hair on fire? Uh, well, tomorrow's Rosh Hashanah, Lashana Tova. Shana Tova, Shana Tova. Um, I, I won't be going to synagogue, uh, just because I don't. And, um, yeah, but I, I will be having a... Did you happen to see Peter, uh, Peter uh, Beinart was responding to someone, I think it was uh, with that Rabbi Linda Goldstein, that was, they were talking... Oh, he actually responded to her? Yeah, you saw the one about the Rosh Hashanah Machzors, you know, that she was trying to, to tell people, if you want a Rosh Hashanah Machzor that does not uh, uh, refer to Israel. Uh, Define Machzor for our, our viewers, because not everybody might not know. Machzor is a uh, prayer book for uh, Rosh Hashanah. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, 
uh, Peter Beinart uh, uh, retweeted it, uh, saying something about how you know. They, I, I think he said something like he has trouble finding one too, and you know this is he was endorsing this or something. I looked in my art scroll, Moxor for Rosh Hashanah. I don't see any anything about Israel in there. Uh, we and I think Peter uh, Beinart should know at this point that Rabbi Linda Goldstein is a parody account. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Okay. Well, he was duped. That's why we gave him the Shmigedi of the Year award last year. Mm -hmm. He was in the little film, right? He was in the trailer. That was him uh, halfway through. Maybe he wasn't uh, endorsing it. I have to. Ch I don't remember offhand exactly what he said, but he retweeted it. Oh, okay. Well, uh, Rabbi Linda Goldstein, whoever she is in reality, should be proud. <laughs> she has accomplished. She, her voice or their voice has been heard. All right. Well, let's sign off. This has been um, a great uh, first uh, attempt at a show um, on our parts. I'm going to do it up nicely and figure out how the hell to post it somewhere. And um, we hope that you are still actually watching. And if you are still watching, that you will tune in for future episodes. We have no regular schedule at this point. Um, you know, the, the, the strike of the Hollywood writers has impacted us as well. We are writing our own material at this point because our professional uh, team um, has, you know, walked out on us. We normally have Larry David writing our scripts yeah, for us. Yeah. Wait a sec, does this make us scabs then? Are we violating? Yeah, it? we're scabs. Oh, yeah. okay. We've crossed the picket line, yeah. Okay, Okay. well, we not only um, are we fascist supremacists for supporting Israel, we've also just crossed the picket line. Exactly. Yeah. What could you do? All right, well, thank you very much, and um, we hope to see you in the future. Take care.